Welcome everyone to our second lecture. Um, I want to remind you at this time, please turn off your cell phones. Channel 17 is here again. And um, I don't know if you get the email that Glenn sends out the few days before our lecture, but he did put on it when you could watch the last week's lecture if you want to. And if you didn't get that information and want it, please contact me and um, my name and, and Betsy Gardner and my email or telephone number is in the brochure. Um, I have a little bit of um, unpleasant news to tell you. Um, Beth Wood is our, the chair of our program committee. She and her committee have put together this wonderful program, and she's done it for us several years. Unfortunately, Beth broke her leg. And she has been in the hospital and is going to be going to rehab, and she will have some time recuperating. However, there's nothing wrong with her brain. She's got her computer, and I'm sure she'll be lining up for next semester very soon. We hope, but um, she doesn't want any company, but if anyone wants to send her a card, we'll pass on her address. And now, um, in place of Beth, we have Carol Hinkle, our vice president, who will introduce the speaker. I don't pretend to um, replace Beth, but here we go. So today, our speaker is Devin Coleman. I think some of you have heard him before, and if you haven't, you're in for a really wonderful treat. He is the state architectural historian for the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation. And a little of Devin Coleman's background, he graduated with a historic preservation major at UVM. He studied art history at Colby College. He lives in Burlington, so all of that, he's even a native now. So warmly, I'd like to have you welcome Devin Coleman. All right. Great. So do we need a sound check for the camera? Are we good? A little feedback? <laughs> Is that better? A little better? Better? One, two, three. Okay, we'll try that. So, well, thank you for having me here. It's great to be with your group again, and we'll be talking about art and, and architecture of the New Deal. But I, before I start, I wanted to note that you have your speaker next week, Glenn Andrus, talking about the Justin Morrill Homestead and then a field trip to the homestead in Stratford. You all have to go. Um, it's a fantastic place, and early fall is the perfect time to visit, and it's actually one of the state-owned historic sites that the Division for Historic Preservation, where I work, that we own and operate. Um, so it's really, it's worth the trip, and there are some brochures on the back table with information about all of our state-owned historic sites, and we hope you'll come out and visit those uh, before they close for the, the season in mid-October. So, we will be talking about art and architecture during the New Deal, and this is a period that's of interest uh, to me personally because there is so much activity. There is so much uh, energy and excitement about art and building, even though it was the middle of the Great Depression, and it was the government sponsorship of these programs that really brought that about and generated uh, the, gave the basic training, if you will, for numerous artists and architects who then went on to very productive careers in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. So this is really a pivotal time in American culture artistically. And we'll start out with, you know, we call it the alphabet soup of government programs. The Civil Works Administration, the Emergency Relief, Treasury Department, the WPA, the PWA, the, you know, just the CCC, it goes on and on, these acronyms, and I won't burden you with learning all of them, but basically this is to show that there were multiple overlapping federal programs, all with different purposes, but some similar goals in terms of 
providing mean, meaningful employment for artists and architects. And how they achieved that uh, was carried out in different ways. But there were three, three main purposes that really run through all these programs. And the first is to provide meaningful employment and projects for artists and architects. And the second is to provide public artwork for public buildings. And the third is to bring art to the general public. This is, the t this is a time in America when, unless you lived in a major urban center, your town probably did not have a fine art gallery. Unless you were really wealthy, you didn't have original paintings in your house. So very few Americans were actually exposed to original works of art. It was more uh, you know, pictures and calendars, the mass production fine artwork that was sent out to farms. And every farm had the same calendar with the same paintings in it. But original artwork was really not that common in, in the everyday life of the average American. So this was a way that the government thought, instead of making people go to a museum to see fine art, let's put the artwork where the people are already going, like the post office, the courthouse, public spaces, libraries. And that was really the genesis of this whole public arts project, was to get the patron, the government, and the, the artists, the painters, and sculptors, and the people all working together to provide a cultural experience uh, that everyone could, exp could enjoy. And this was certainly a time when uh, there was a lot of change going on in the art world. Uh, this is, you know, the early modernism was taking root post World War I, pre World War II. That 20s, 30s period is really pivotal in artists and architects trying to decide okay, do we go back to how they did things before World War I, back in the 19th century, the 18th century, or is this our chance to start fresh? start blank slate, new ideas, new thoughts. And some went back to the old ways, other went, others looked to the future. People like Stuart Davis, um, fantastic painting. This is called Swing Landscape. This is the jazz age. This is, you know, bright, colorful, abstract, you know, in your face. And this is not what most people wanted to see. <laughs> This was New York, this is Chicago, this is LA, this is not Des Moines, Iowa. You know, they didn't want to see this in, um, in the rural areas. What they did want to see was scenes like this. Baptism in Kansas, John Stuart Curry. And this, this genre of art uh, really comes to the forefront, uh, the regionalism. Works of art that are looking at a specific regional identity. And usually in a, a very idealized, very fond look back to the not, not too distant past. They're, they're not going back hundreds of years, you know, maybe one or two generations, but they're also not looking at the present. Very few of these New Deal paintings are showing present conditions because it was the Depression. They didn't want to see pictures of what they were living. They wanted to look back to the, the good old days. And another John Stuart Curry painting, Our Good Earth, you know, the heroic individual farmer, you know, in control of his land and his kids in the farmhouse in the background. You know, it's that, that individual that is really emphasized. As well as scenes like Thomas Hart Benton, Cradling Wheat. I mean, Benton is almost surreal in his, you know, these flowing hillsides and fields of wheat and the, the bodies of the, uh, the people harvesting and this very romanticized look at the American countryside. And Grant Wood, another regionalist. Not surreal. These are the most perfectly planted rows of corn you will ever see. <laughs> they, yeah. Grant Wood was all about precision, geometry, this is, you know, the ideal farmstead. That's the farmhouse in his famous painting, American Gothic, um, in the background. So looking, looking at these idealized visions of America, the good old days before the Depression took place.
Now there's also a very strong influence uh, in this period of illustrators like N.C. Wyeth uh, doing these very dramatic, heroic, uh, and realistic, uh, you know, nobody's mistaking this for Thomas Hart Benton. This is, this is realism, um, Captain John Paul Jones, uh, and these, these illustrations that so many people grew up looking at in picture books. And of course, if we're talking about murals in the 30s, uh, we have to talk about Diego Rivera, the great Mexican muralist, and his work at Rockefeller Center, uh, which was, uh, did not go over well. Uh, it was ordered removed by the Rockefellers uh, when he painted in a picture of Lenin and an unflattering portrait of John D. Rockefeller Jr. And they said, that's <laughs> enough, you're out. They ripped out the mural. So this was a big deal. This was major news and something that the government sponsoring mural projects did not want any part of. So you, you don't find much politics in New Deal murals. They're, they're pretty tame. So the Diego Rivera episode was definitely, uh, you know, he was very influential for the artists painting the murals in post offices and libraries, but those, those artists knew better than to pro propose anything hinting of socialism or political. So let's look at some of the buildings and first we'll start looking at uh, murals in Vermont buildings, post offices. The buildings themselves were all uh, New Deal projects and some, a combination of either plans coming out of Washington DC from a, a headquarters uh, design office or uh, local architects designing the buildings. Uh, the buildings are typically colonial revival, neoclassical, uh, very, you know, the White River Junction Post Office, or sorry, Rutland, uh, Rutland Post Office, just a very good, solid, proud building right in downtown Rutland. And this building has a series of really beautiful murals in it. And these are right in the lobby. They're not hidden upstairs in a courtroom. They're, they're right there. You walk in the door and there are the murals. And that was the intent. They wanted people to be face to face with this artwork. And it really does, you know, it comes right down. You can see the height in the door. The murals are right there. You can reach out and touch them. Um, so these, these murals fall right into the category of the historical narrative. And looking at the early history of Vermont, uh, we've got Ethan Allen, of course. Wouldn't be a Vermont mural without Ethan Allen. And the Green Mountain Boys on the left. Above is uh, the Call to Unite, where they rally the, the Green Mountain Boys. And then uh, on the right is the British uh, that they are rallying against. And this, this is another picture placed above the elevator. Um, not I think they cut out part of it for that. Um, but this is the Green Mountain Boys gathering at the Breckenridge Farm in uh, southern Vermont to scare off the sheriff from Albany who was coming to reclaim what they called the New York grants, Vermonters <coughs> called the New Hampshire grants, these overlapping land claims, and they were holding their ground. And another one, uh, and see how these are all they're built into the architecture. So these, these niches were designed by the architect specifically to hold works of art. So these are not, uh, let's see. Yeah, that might be as good as we get. That, yeah. um, so these are not paintings that are an afterthought where they build the building and then they think, oh, you know, they, we should put a painting on that wall and they commission it and hang it up. These are part of the design of the building from the start. So they're really uh, integral to the building itself. And this, this is an interesting one, I think. This shows the freeing of the first slave in Vermont in 1777 by Captain Ebenezer Allen. And so this was a very, you know, something that Vermonters were very proud of, having the first constitution to outlaw slavery, and they wanted to 
that play up these, these important uh, moments in Vermont history. And finally, Benedict Arnold commanding the first naval battle on Lake Champlain, another heroic Vermont uh, historic event in the Revolutionary War. And if that looks familiar, you know, here's N.C. Wyeth and here's uh, Stephen Belaski, the artist who did these. So really showing the parallels between that illustration genre and these, uh, what the artists were doing in the New Deal. Uh, the artist painter of all these murals, Stephen Belaski, was from Bellows Falls, uh, so local painter, and uh, really did a remarkable job on this series and then did several other large murals um, throughout the state because of the success of these. Now, in White River Junction, um, another post office, uh, 1934, right downtown, beautiful. You know, this is, I think, when a Vermont, a little Vermont town gets a building like this, it puts them on the map. You know, that's something to be proud of. Not every town has a big grand post office like that. White River Junction being a railroad hub warranted a really good building. The paintings uh, by S. Douglas Crockwell and another uh, Vermont and upstate New York uh, artist, 1937. And there he is, uh, from Ohio, studied in St. Louis, uh, lived in Glens Falls, New York, and did several other uh, murals. A lot of these artists would do multiple projects. Once they kind of got their foot in the door and were a known entity, then they could get other commissions. And there's this somewhat kind of derisive attitude that other artists who were not doing these projects took. And they said, well, you know, he's just painting for the section, and that the section of fine arts was the federal program uh, sponsoring these post office murals, and artists pretty quickly figured out what the section of fine arts wanted to see. Rural scenes, nice landscapes, and so if you were painting the section, you kind of, you were playing to what you knew they wanted to fund. So if, if you pushed the boundaries too much, you were not going to get commissioned. It was that simple. So Crockwell, um, and here's a picture of him actually painting uh, the White River Junction mural. And what's great is that his family has all the letters and materials and correspondence between him and the federal government to do this commission. So it's a really neat glimpse into the history of how these projects came to be. The mural itself is one of, it's really dark can't see it very well. Um, it's one of the more unusual murals in that it's very free form. Most of the murals would fill the wall panel from edge to edge, top to bottom, would all be painted. Crockwell took a, a much uh, more abstract where that white portion in the middle is a flowing river that kind of comes out, breaks over the pediment to the door, and then goes up around the edges. So an unusual composition for this mural, and some details. He's highlighting the stone industry. So that's walls of granite or marble and a stone cutter on the left. And what I love is that he was actually really, uh, he wanted to portray this accurately. And so he's showing this man with the mallet hammering, uh, using a plug and feather system with the diagram on the lower right, where a drill, or a hole would be drilled into the stone and then two feathers put in and then a wedge-shaped plug hammered in, and you do a line of those, and you break off the stone. So they're not just, you know, he's someone who really knows how stone is quarried. So these artists knew what they were painting. And the people living in this town, seeing this, they also knew how stone was quarried. So they would call him on it if he, <laughs> if he got it wrong. <laughs> and the other side of the mural, maple sugaring. Of course, it's Vermont. Um, countless murals of maple sugaring. In St. Albans, uh, right downtown, right on the main, main strip in St. Albans, uh, the Federal Built Post Office and Custom House, uh, two large murals, Haying and Sugaring Off by Philip von Salza. And I think what's really neat about these murals is that von Salza was, uh, let's see, he was I think born in Sweden, immigrated to the US, fought for the US in World War I, and then was hired by the US government in the 30s to paint 
scenes of rural, you know, Vermont, New England life. And I think for an immigrant, that would have been pretty special to, for his adopted country to hire him as an artist to paint scenes of that country that he's fought for. So the murals are, uh, and this is your typical format, you know, big rectangular murals filling the wall spaces. You've got uh, the farmers haying the fields, loading up the wagons, you know, horse-drawn wagons. This is uh, the 1930s. We had cars and trucks, but they didn't want to see those. They wanted wagons and horses. Uh, the barn in the back, uh, plowing the field with a horse. They had tractors. That little barn dance, the housewife on the porch, just this idyllic scene of rural Vermont life. And the other, so these are on either end of the lobby in the post office, uh, so they face each other, and it's maple sugaring. Um, and, you know, very playful. The kids rolling on the ground, playing with the dog and snowballs, and the boy and the girl talking on the wood pile, and, you know, there's a lot of activity, a lot of mo the smoke or the steam billowing up from the evaporators. And so there's a lot of action. These aren't just static uh, renderings. But certainly, especially in St. Albans, you know, you have to show maple sugaring. Now, Northfield, uh, which is, you know, we've been looking at larger urban centers, if you will. Um, Northfield also got its own much smaller scale post office, still colonial revival, um, but not the monumental two-story buildings we see in Rutland and White River and St. Albans. So the buildings would correspond to the scale of the community. Charles Doherty was the artist uh, for the murals in this building. And there's Charles, and actually his father was actually a very prominent muralist as well, so it was in his family to do these projects. And this might be my favorite one, it's skiing. <laughs> and <laughs> you can see the various skiers and, you know, they're going knock-kneed and they're falling down and, and just, but they're having fun. And this, this was painted, um, I believe, in the put a date on that, in the mid-30s, and this is when the ski industry in Vermont is still in its infancy. The CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps, another New Deal program, at this very time is cutting the first run of Mount, Mount Mansfield, nosedive. They're cutting the first downhill ski trails on Mansfield. So skiing is uh, just becoming popular. And so I think it's interesting that this is much more of a current event scene, but it's a fun event. You know, this was a chance people could forget their woes of the Depression and go out and have fun on the ski hills. And in addition to this large mural, there are three other medallions, if, for lack of a better word, placed on the walls above the mailboxes. And maple sugaring, <laughs> again. And this one, you know, that's, like the jolly green giant, uh, just again, this heroic farmer figure is, runs through all of these paintings. Uh, just the, that individual, the master of the land, kind of the cornucopia of crops and goodness. And the last one being Northfield, a stone carver. He's working on a monument. Northfield had a long history of uh, quarrying. And this one, interestingly, does include the bed of a pickup truck and a power pole. So the artist, this is more of a present day view. Um, he's, he's not afraid to, uh, to show those modern conveniences, but they're kind of pushed off in the background. And in Woodstock, another nice little smaller scale post office artist was Bernadine Custer, one of the few female artists that did work uh, on these post office murals, 1940. And Bernadine Custer is someone I'd love to study more. Um, her papers are at the UVM Special Collections Department and studied at the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, lived in Landgrove, and I think the Landgrove Historical Society owns her property now and is working on going through its collections. Um, 
so as you know, a female artist at this time, that would cert certainly be interesting to trace her evolution and, and work on these projects. And what's great is that we have the preparatory sketches for her murals. And so this is one of those sketches. It's maybe 11 by 17, roughly. Um, but she's sketched out um, the basic format for the mural. And all of these had to be reviewed and vetted by the powers that be, both at the state level and at the federal level. So there is a lot of back and forth in terms of, OK, what are you going to paint? What's your subject matter? Who are these people? You know, what, just making sure it was all on the up and up. Um, and then once it was approved, then the artist would actually execute the work. And this is dark. Um, the finished mural. And as you can kind of see, it features four prominent men right in the center, each with a building lined up right behind them. Interestingly, none of those buildings are in Woodstock. <laughs> a little artistic license. Um, but as you move across the painting on the left, and I think we can see it better here, um, it's working chronologically. So the early frontier days, the, the settlers coming with their oxen and horses, drawing their wagons and clearing the forest. And then uh, the stagecoach, and you see the man in the middle chopping down the tree to build the pioneer log cabin. And then as we move into the middle, we see these four gentlemen, and they are all uh, people who had an important role in Woodstock history. So this is a very site-specific mural. These people wouldn't be shown in a post office in Burlington. They're very uh, linked to the Woodstock history. We've got first Hosea Ballou, a Universalist preacher who uh, lived in Woodstock and wrote a very important work, the Treatise on Atonement, in 1805 when he was living there. And Jacob Colomer, lawyer, politician, postmaster general uh, for President Taylor, lived in Woodstock for about 30 years. And John Cotton Dana, a renowned library and museum director, born in Woodstock, and the Dana family is generations in Woodstock. And in fact, the Woodstock Historical Society occupies the Dana House in Woodstock. So highlighting three of the big names in town, and what I think is really kind of sweet is that the fourth person is the unnamed farmer. <laughs> he's just a, kind of a, a stand-in for the working man. And he's holding a scythe. He's you know, ready to go out in the fields. And all the other guys are up with their you know, fancy shirts and collars. And he's ready to go to work. And on the right side, uh, curiously, we have a man heading off to play golf accompanied by a woman heading off to go skiing. <laughs> uh, I don't know where they did that in Woodstock. <laughs> but, but this is showing that transition into the present day, Woodstock uh, modeling itself as a recreational community, a resort, a, a play area. And downhill skiing was very popular. Golf was very popular, these leisure pursuits. And in the background is a couple heading off to go hunting. Further back is a couple on horses, and there's right between the two men, you see a uh, man at a gas pump and a car. <laughs> and apparently that was pretty risque. <laughs> the elites in Woodstock did not want a dirty gas pump in their painting, <laughs> but it stayed. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of correspondence back and forth in those files about what kind of image are we presenting if we have a dirty gas pump, an automobile? So very interesting social <laughs> interaction. And Island Pond. Anyone been to Island Pond? OK, it's way up there. <laughs> it's a beautiful spot. A surprising place for a major post office and a mural. You would think a more urban area would get it. And it turns out they never built it. <laughs> um, so they, they had grand plans. Uh, Bars Miller, who was a painter, uh, 
was selected through a, a nationwide competition sponsored by Life Magazine called the 48 States Competition. And there's this, this great quote in the editors of the magazine and reviewing all the entries, and this is printed right in the magazine, apparently rural Americans are artistic stay-at-homes with a preference for paintings that reproduce experiences in scenes and parts of history with which they are familiar. Significantly, the much publicized Main Street atmosphere of small towns does not seem to mean so much to the people who actually live in them. <laughs> and that's true, none of these murals show what we consider today the classic downtown, the rural village. There's another comment I read that in looking at the New Deal murals and post offices, you couldn't blame someone for thinking that America hadn't gone through the Industrial Revolution yet because they're all, you know, farmers in fields with horses and, you know, men chopping down trees by hand. There's, there's no, you know, modern technology, no airplanes, no big factories. Um, they really wanted to look back a few generations. And that's what Barst Miller proposed for uh, the Island Pond Post Office. And this was his uh, sketch, his proposal sketch for Life Magazine. And it shows two men uh, working a portable sawmill of sorts to cut up lumber. And in the background is uh, the, the lake, a railroad roundhouse, and the train station on the far right. And the description of the painting uh, it talks about how Bars Miller has uh, previously favored allegorical figures, uh, but now he's looking at a more outright reflection of American life. So no, no Greek gods, no, no, you know, kind of out there allegorical scenes. Straight and narrow, the working man. And if we look at a detail of the picture, you can see on the left the. Uh, railroad station, and on the right, the actual railroad station that's still there today. Uh, no question, it's the same building. And this becomes interesting because in the same competition, Paul Sample, another Vermont artist, artist in residence at Dartmouth for decades, lived in Norwich, Vermont, he submitted an entry uh, for the Westerly Rhode Island Post Office. Silent Pond. <laughs> There's the train station in the background. <laughs> and the people in Westerly were not fooled. Um, they did not want this painting. And in fact, the, the post office in Westerly, Westerly, Rhode Island was not built either. So Island Pond and Westerly both lost out. And I'll toss in one more. This was another proposal for Island Pond that shows how a lot of these submittals were presented for consideration. Uh, the artist would be given the dimensions of the wall space and noting where the bulletin boards had to go, where the door went, what the casing was, uh, and then they could lay out their design and present that for review. And this one by uh, an Italian painter, Peppino Mengravit, uh, and it shows maple sugaring. <laughs> So the murals today, um, I was really happy to find that they're all intact. None of them have been removed, painted over, damaged, and I think a lot of that's due in a large part because they're, they're mostly up high on the walls, so they're, they're out of the reach of little um, fingers and getting run into with mail carts and things like that. Um, but they're also largely overlooked and that they've been there so long that people don't see them anymore. I was in the Northfield Post Office taking pictures of, it's like an 18 foot by nine foot mural. Like you, you can't not see it. And a woman was like, oh, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm taking pictures of that painting up there. She said, oh, I've never seen that. <laughs> Look up. <laughs> so so they're, they're out there kind of hiding in plain sight. So when you're out and about, you know, look around and, and look up. Um, a few other examples uh, that I found through this research uh, in Bellows Falls Middle School, um, another series of murals by Stephen Belaski, who did the Rutland Post Office murals, did uh, 
these huge murals up on the walls in what was then the high school, it's now the middle school, showing uh, this is the first Protestant sermon in Vermont. So another historical, allegorical theme. And on the opposite wall is a scene of Native Americans uh, spearing salmon at the Great Falls in Bellows Falls. And so these were, these were also uh, WPA projects, so not not Treasury Department in the post office. These were WPA fine arts projects, but in a public school so that the kids could have access to original works of art. And these are still in place, they're in great condition. They're up in a double height uh, stairwell, so nobody can get to them. If you've driven through Middlebury, you might have seen this little monument. It's kind of on its own little island where all the roads converge and you're worrying about being in the correct lane to make your turn. It's a really sweet little relief carving. Um, the Emma Hart Willard Memorial. And this was uh, put in place uh, to honor Emma Willard, who was an early advocate for women's education in Middlebury. And there's not a whole lot of public sculpture that came out of the New Deal. Most, there's a lot of paintings, but public sculpture, not so much. So this is a really great example. And it's, it's very low relief and very finely executed. Uh, T.A., let's see, the designers were Marion Guild, an, another female. And for decades, she was not credited with this work. The credit went to Pierre Zwick, who is the head of the fine arts program for Vermont. And then eventually it came out that she was really the designer of this memorial. Um, and it was carved by uh, T.A. Campbell. So we've looked at the murals and some of the buildings, the post office mainly. Um, but let's look at some of the New Deal building programs, mainly the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, the Public Works Administration, the PWA, and the Resettlement Administration. Um, I won't say too much about resettlement other than they were known for their planned communities, the green towns, uh, Greendale, Wisconsin, Green Hills, Ohio, Greenbelt, Maryland. These were meant to be prototypical uh, communities in which uh, you know, people could live in harmony together in a fully planned out modern uh, development. In Vermont, uh, some of the CCC projects that we have are really remarkable. Uh, the CCC was hugely influential in, in the Vermont, making Vermont what it is today in terms of our state parks, our ski industry, uh, state forests, public infrastructure. It all goes back to the CCC. They laid the groundwork for all of those developments. And one of my favorite buildings that came out of the CCC is the ski lodge at the base of Nosedive. That's the ski trail going straight up Mount Mansfield. And this was designed in 1941 by architect David Freed. And he is one of, if not the only, one of just a handful of modernist architects working for the CCC that actually got his designs built. Your typical CCC building is big, heavy, round log, kind of Adirondack style. And Freed was able to incorporate some round log construction, but also this very modern shed roof, full height space with a wall of windows. Um, it's really unlike anything else that the CC built anywhere, nationally. Another example of Freed's work, the Crystal Lake Bathhouse in Barton, Vermont. Again, we we don't know how these got approved because they're so unlike anything else that DC was approving. And one researcher thinks that they probably figured it's just Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> just do it. <laughs> and, but you know, there's no, no mistaking that this is a modern building. And compared to buildings like this, the Hubbard cabin at the Middlebury Snow Bowl this is your typical CCC, you know, pretty small scale, rustic, big logs, and a, the forest building. Um, but these, these two projects by David Freed are, are really quite notable within the 
the national context of CCC construction. And you know, he's working with stone and brick and wood, things that the average, you know, the CCC was employing young men, you know, 17 to 28 years old or so. They weren't skilled. They just, you know, give them a shovel to dig a ditch and lay a foundation. And so these buildings had to be really straightforward. They had to be board and batten siding, wood clabbered. Um, but the way they were put together, the forms are very modern. And so it's, it's really interesting to see that happening in rural Vermont. The Public Works Administration uh, was really interested in public education. This is the new school in Cabot, which replaced a, I don't think I wrote down the quote, but there's a great description of just the, the awful one-room schoolhouse with broken windows and an outhouse off the back and the broken floorboard. They were really playing it up, <laughs> that we need a new school. And this was a big investment in a little town like Cabot uh, to have a brand new school uh, in you know, colonial revival uh, style. And a building I'm sure a lot of you are more familiar with, uh, the Southwick Memorial Building at the UVM Redstone Campus. Uh, McKim, Mead, and White, nationally renowned architects, but this was funded by the Public Works Administration. So it wasn't just small scale locals doing these projects. Here's a nationally renowned architecture firm working with PWA money. And other buildings such as Tracy Hall, uh, which is in Norwich, right on the green. Uh, they did a lot of uh, civic, you know, town halls, uh, meeting places, community gathering places, libraries, public schools, and so on. And finally, probably the single most beautiful sewage treatment plant <laughs> in St. Albans. <laughs> All right, this is, um, this is amazing. <laughs> They've, They've built this beautiful little brick building to hold the machinery uh, with a tower. There's a flagpole with an American flag. They've spelled out St. Albans sewage plant on the hillside, probably <laughs> with white rocks. There are gravel pathways lined with shrubs. I mean, this was really special. <laughs> and for a town like St. I don't know the history of their sewage treatment system in St. Albans, but you know, this was probably a big step up. Um, and to have the federal government investing and employing local young men to build these projects was a big deal. And I think that's really the key. And why I find this so interesting is that it's a, a period when the government was willing to invest in its citizens, put them to work doing meaningful jobs, especially the artists. There was a lot of talk about, well, you know, why should we give money to artists to make paintings? And, isn't that better than putting them to work in a factory? You know, let them do what they're good at. You know, pay them to create works of art that the public can enjoy, and that's their skill set. And others are really good at you know, laying brick. Let the bricklayers do that. Let the masons do other things, the landscapers. So all these trades come together and create what I think are some really special projects. I, I have not been up to see if this is still there. I somewhat doubt it. <laughs> but. So a few of the resources, if you're interested in knowing more about these programs, um, there are a couple great books. The New Deal, a 75th anniversary celebration, uh, came out in 2008. Uh, Long Range Public Investment, The Forgotten Legacy of the New Deal by Bob Leininger is a fantastic book. And he really makes the argument that we're ready for a new deal. And that these buildings have lasted more than three quarters of a century now. A lot of the infrastructure, the sewers, the sidewalks, the roads that we use today come out of the New Deal. We're ready for a new program to put people to work and reinvest in public infrastructure. And Wall to Wall America, Post Office Murals and the Great Depression looks specifically at the whole Post Office Mural uh, project. And finally, if you want to really dig into this, the Bennington Museum right now has an exhibit called Crash to Creativity, The New Deal in Vermont. 
and it's up through November 4th, and they're looking at fine arts, architecture, uh, all sorts, there were quilting projects, there were, uh, you name it, the New Deal, it, it was in there somewhere, and the Bennington Museum. I haven't been down to see the exhibit yet, but it's, I'll be heading down there. Um, so certainly, be sure to check that out if you want to know more. And that's what I have. Thank you very much. <laughs> Happy to answer any questions. If Yeah, we'll bring up the lights and then we'll... Now, do we need to use a microphone for the questions? Okay, do you want to go in, go in back over there? Or... Okay. Yeah. I know you said the building, the murals were in good condition, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but people used to smoke yes. in public buildings. So I'm wondering if any of them were cleaned, or do some of them need to be cleaned? Um, I know the murals in the Bellows Falls Middle School have been cleaned um, and stabilized somewhat. There was some flaking of paint. Um, the others, I really haven't looked at them close enough to see how dirty they might be, I mean, because they're up. <laughs> you need a scaffolding to, to get up and look. Um, but I'm, I'm sure they could use a little TLC to, to clean them up and make sure most of them were painted on canvas in the artist's studio and then glued to the walls. So they're not frescoes. They're not like painted into the plaster. Um, and if that glue starts to release, that could cause some problems. But it would, I would love to see some sort of comprehensive inventory and conditions assessment done. That would be really neat. Uh, there was a gigantic set of murals in my hometown of 11,000 people in Illinois uh -huh. in the movie theater. Mm -hmm. And always I thought it was a WPA project. And when I went back there 10 years ago, there had been a remodeling project and those murals were gone, gone, gone. And I couldn't find any record of mm -hmm. what had happened to them. And they were specifically local. Mm -hmm. They had to do with uh, young men who fought in the Great War, identifiable. Hmm. Um, the growing of corn, uh, coal mining. Uh, there was a factory there, mm -hmm. and there was a great painting of, of the factory. So does anyone have a handle on these wonderful works that are gone? Um, there's certainly an effort to try to catalog what's out there, uh, but what's been lost, it's hard to say. Um, it, it can happen so one person with a bucket of paint and a roller, mm -hmm. it's gone in an afternoon. Um, it can happen so quickly. Um, I do know there are, Stephen Belaski, the Bellows Falls artist, also did two murals at uh, Fort Ethan Allen that are gone, but I found them. <laughs> They're wrapped up in storage at Fort Ticonderoga, of all places. They don't want them, so if anybody wants them, <laughs> knows of a good place. Um, but they're, they're out there, and it just takes some, some sleuthing and asking questions, and I do a lot of research on old newspapers, because usually when these, newspaper, when these murals were installed, there'd be you know, a photographer to take a picture of the artist and the mural and the mayor and so on. And, so finding those references to figure out what used to be somewhere and then going there and if it's not there, okay, what happened to it? So it's a lot of detective work. Yeah. Uh, as a young boy, I recall a saying used to be, there's more cows than people in Vermont. <laughs> now, I'm wondering why there wasn't no cows depicted in the, the artwork. <laughs> Wow, good question. I don't know. That's, that's, you know, there's no pictures of dairying. Maybe the artist didn't know how to paint cows. I'm, I'm <laughs> that's a very good question though. I have a question. I grew up in a small town in Massachusetts. Were any of the Carnegie libraries built during this period? Uh, those were a little earlier. 
were they? Yeah. Because yeah, it's those. it's a beautiful library, and mm -hmm. for such a small town, I'm sure they never had the money to build it themselves. Yeah, I think Carnegie's were okay. were more early 20th century okay. than 1930s. Thank yeah. you. There seems to have been no lack of funds for this pro these projects. Why, why was there so much money available? Uh, there w the artists didn't make, <laughs> they, they were not making a lot of money um, because their, their fee had to include all of their supplies and materials. It was basically a lump sum. Um, so there was, there was money to a certain point, but the artists, it was just enough to keep them solvent. You know, they, they weren't getting rich off these projects by any means. Oh, well, the buildings are a different story. Yeah, there's a lot of money for buildings. Uh, that was part of the infrastructure investment that the government realized they could, they could sort of kill two birds with one stone, these desperate need for new facilities in these communities across the country and a desperate need for employment in the Great Depression, all these unemployed young men, well, put them to work building buildings. Was yeah, yeah, all part of the New Deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, would you repeat again the field trip which is connected with next week's program? Yes, to the and Justin Morrill Homestead. Oh, it's canceled? Oh, it's been canceled. Oh. Well, go on your but own. But what was it? <laughs> Oh, it's, you're going next spring? Okay, it's to the Justin Morrill Homestead in Stratford, Vermont. Stratford. Yep. And I have, um, I was delighted in uh, San Francisco to visit the Coit Tower, which is a fantastic landmark, but ha is full uh, in its circumference of these beautiful New Deal murals. Mm -hmm. Neat. Yes, Sarah. Um, you, you were talking about Paul's sample. He did yes. know how to paint horses and cows. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it reminds me of the, the wonderful mural, which uh, I've forgotten the year, but it must be a little later than the New Deal time when Paul um, painted the huge mural, mural that was at National Life, yes. which has been moved to the Vermont History Museum, right. Vermont Historical Society. And it's down where you can see it at eye level, so yep. you know people ought to visit that as well. Right, and uh, that mural that Sarah's referring to was by Paul Sample, who did some of these New Deal murals. Uh, he painted that in 1956 for the National Life Building yeah. in Montpelier, and it's now at the Vermont History Center. What I what I was led to say beyond that is that these can be moved and reinstalled in new mm -hmm. buildings, so. It makes me think maybe those ones that are rolled up, there ought to be some kind of an RFP put out for yep. people who might be building a new, a new uh, municipal building, as South Burlington will be soon, yeah. et cetera. Yep. Um, but other places in the state that might mm -hmm. be more appropriate for those particular murals. Definitely. Yeah, and th there are examples in other parts of the country where a post office has been torn down and they'll carefully remove the murals and then reinstall them either in the new post office or in a, maybe in the town hall, another suitable public space. Because these are, these are publicly owned works of art. So they're, they're not to just be sold off. You know, it's against the law to put these up for auction, for example. They, they can't just sell them. Uh, so, so they are, you know, they're, they're, we own them, <laughs> so enjoy them. Um, the artists that painted the murals, did they then go on to um, become more popular because of their work? Did they gain, they didn't earn a lot of money, but mm -hmm. did they prosper later as people saw their murals? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure if the murals themselves, because they were in such a, kind of Limited specific space. style. Yeah. Um, if people would see, oh, I love that rural farm scene, I'm gonna hire, you know, people yeah. weren't hiring yeah. painters at that time. I'd say it was more of a helping them in the development of their careers and learning how to paint large scale okay. and then moving on to bigger projects after the Depression and World War II. Okay, and so why did they accept the job? Because they needed the money? Yeah, yep. Okay. 
Yep, there's a way to. And were some, they were they young? Well, they didn't look young in the picture. Um, I would say middle age. Kind of mid career, probably. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I mean, there's a whole series of murals that I just saw in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, that Grant Wood oversaw the whole the design and installation of them, working with a bunch of assistants. And you know, Grant Wood was a major artistic figure at the time, but even he was willing to, you know, for a few bucks. Yeah, that's <laughs> so. Yes. I'm curious as to why the Treasury was involved. It doesn't sound doesn't sound like a treasury function to be paying artists. Uh, At least not the yes. current treasury. Yeah, the treasury department, because they were the funding behind all the, any government building being built. They were the funding source. And so there was, it was figured out that, well, if they're building the buildings, they should pay for some artwork also. Today, all those buildings are overseen by the General Services Administration, which also has a, a public art program. Any new federal building has a certain percentage of the building fee has to include public art. Uh, any other questions? This isn't a question, but can you put back the slide of the man you said that was I think from Sweden, it would yes. had a long... Um, Philip van Salza. Let's see, he did... You went really quickly through yeah. and I wondered if there was anything more interesting there that I missed. Yep, so he's the one who fought in World War I for the United States and then coming back, uh, became an artist, gave up the military career and did murals in New Hampshire, Nebraska, and North Carolina. So you can see once, once you did one, then you're kind of in, you were a known entity and you could get other commissions. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, great, thank you very much. Bye.